false teaching is far more popular than biblical truth. Absolutely. Like well, of the religious world, yeah. like 95% of it is probably I agree. just false teaching. Yeah, it's funny. And, people say, you know, it seems like it seems like you think everyone's a false teacher. I'm like, no, I think those that teach false things are false teachers. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Authentic Christian Podcast. I'm Aaron, this is Scott, and today we're talking about contending for the faith. All right, so in this episode, we're talking about contending for the faith, uh, defending the faith, defending the gospel, uh, whatever you want to call it, basically many synonyms. We're just talking about how we need to stand up for what's right, stand up for the truth. Um, You know, we live in 2024 uh, when we're filming this, and it's, I think, obvious to anybody that lives in our culture that the culture, at least in America, other countries, it's different. Like, I remember when I traveled to you know Africa and did some mission work there. Like you could literally just tell somebody they like, no, you're wrong. That's wrong. And they didn't get offended. You know, they were like, okay, why do you say that? They were inform- interested in like the facts, right? Yeah. And our culture, I feel like is not like that at all. It was so, it was so <laughs> shocking to me. I remember we were talking with a Pentecostal preacher and uh, one of the local Africans was like, no, you're wrong. And the guy was like, okay, tell me why. And so he told him a Bible verse, and he's like, okay, you are right. The Pentecostal preacher said, you are right. And I was like, is there a hidden camera? Like, is this, is he is messing this with us? Is, and they're like, no. He, is it really this he easy? He did not know about that verse. He's changed his position on the topic. I was like, miraculous gifts. I don't remember what it was. I think, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it was about. Yeah. And he just like changed his position like that based off information he hadn't seen. It was like, it wasn't like one sentence. It was like a study, but he was like, okay. And I'm like, is this is this a joke? Like, because you just don't see that in the United States. In the United no. States, it's like defend what I've always believed at all costs, even if I've seen scripture that teaches me otherwise. With most people, because it would be embarrassing for me to be wrong. Yeah, I think our culture is really obsessed with um, status. Yeah, and so like admitting you're wrong affects your status in society, right? You're yeah, you're capable of being wrong. What? You're not perfect. Yeah, like, you don't yeah. always have the answers. That means not everybody will always come to me. And it, I mean, you I know, think it's that, that just, kind of a spiral. It's a symptom of pride. Yeah, exactly. Like our whole country is so prideful. Anyway, yeah. so in you know we're talking about defending the faith. Can be another episode. <laughs> yeah, we've already done one enough. Day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, one day we've already did like six on. Pride. Yeah, you're right. Four or five. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just. But I mean, if you hear words like conflict, right? I mean, as a, as a listener, when in Scott, you too, when, when you hear these words, does something good come to your mind immediately? Think about our culture, conflict. No, I mean, it's it's usually hard to deal with conflict yeah. in some ways. Like, it's not always, well, I don't know anybody that thinks conflict I got a list is of like four, Yeah, I got like four or five words. Sure. So conflict, debate. Yeah. Dis- disagreement. Um opposition or controversy yeah like when you hear those things in our culture it's immediately a negative thing like whoa whoa, we can't do that right it's it's negative like you said about conflict so i mean our culture doesn't like those words or ideas um are we are we supposed to be what does culture say about being offensive well, uh, in in our culture, we're definitely not supposed to offend. That's like that's one of the most cardinal sins. Don't offend. Everybody's equal in terms of their opinion. Like the, everybody's opinion is valid. Yeah. Never ever contradict anybody else's statements at all. Yeah. Um, and we've taken that to the nth degree. Like you, you have some places where they would love to pass laws, and some have tried. Maybe right now, a lot of those are just over the border in other places in the world, but they pass laws to stop you from just simply quoting what the scripture says yeah. in, in regard, especially to uh, topics relating to homosexuality and the trans movement, things like that. Yeah. There's a lot of hate speech laws. Yeah. Well, you stand up and you quote that, well, homosexuals and such were some of you and, yeah. and they, they are very offended by that. That that's, that's something we're not supposed to do in our society, yeah. but as Christians, we have to, Yeah. right. We still have to speak what it says. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we are told in our culture, don't offend anybody. If you disagree with someone, that's fine, but you better keep it to yourself. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't you dare tell them that they're wrong. And they say, if you say, hey, look, I respect you, I care about you, but you're wrong, that that's rude. Yeah, they still say you're judgmental or they try to act like you're being arrogant or whatever. Like you're putting yourself above them in some way. Correct, yeah. They, they tell you that that's rude, judgmental, yep. um, and you might make things awkward. You know, yeah. and that's, it's like the cardinal sin. You can't make culture. things awkward. You can't make things awkward. You can't make somebody feel awkward. Right. And so if you're a Christian, as we are living in this culture, the question becomes, 
How are you supposed to love your neighbor as yourself? Matthew 22, 39. What does that mean? Love your neighbor as yourself. Does love mean that we just tolerate everything? Do we tolerate some things? You know, the, the culture tells us, well, that's what love is. Love is accepting people the way they are. And we're as Christians like, well, is that what is that what true love is? Do you just accept people the way they are? Or do you, 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in truth. Yeah. So, I mean, I was on the phone with somebody today asking me a question about, you know, whether they should go along with, you know, certain things that their company's mandating that they don't think are right. They think that it'd be lying. And so yeah. I was like, you can't, you can't, you can't go along with what your company says and lie just because you don't want to offend somebody. And so that's what we're talking about in this episode. We're talking about defending, defending the faith, contending for the faith. And of course, we're going to talk about doing it in a loving manner, right? Yeah. But we're talking about that. So the word defend, right? If you look at an English dictionary, um, which is where we're starting, we're not going to end up in there. We're going to go to the original languages too. But to defend means to resist an attack made on someone or something, to protect from harm or danger. Like we're, we're familiar with this concept, right? Sports in this country. Yeah, you have your defensive bags and all that. Yeah. You know, football, you have, college football season's yeah, exactly. coming up, right? You, know? you yeah. know, I mean, it's built into the name, right? So there's positions that we, we understand what it means. Yeah. Defend something. Yeah. And so, you're protect it. you know, we use analogies like that even in life. You know, for instance, like when you go from two to three kids, like when we went from two to three, I remember everybody being like, you know, I say the same thing. I'm like, someone, like, how many kids you have? They're like three. I'm like, oh, so you're playing, you're playing zone defense now, right? You don't have man to man, right? So <laughs> we get the sports analogies. And, you know, as far as defending things that you love, that's what you defend, things that are important to you. Just what? A couple weeks ago, uh, you know, former President Donald J. Trump, he's at his uh, rally in yeah. Butler, Pennsylvania. And from 130 yards away, which is a chip shot, man, if you know anything oh, about know. guns, 130 is a chip shot. And I, I don't, you know, it was, it was incredible he didn't get shot in the yeah. I mean, die. Yeah. Like, he yeah, did get shot yeah. in the air. But, Absolutely. Yeah. I but mean, the, what, as soon as shots rang out, there's that Im Im immediate, like, second of, wait, what just happened? And then what happens? The Secret Service tries to get him. They get him on the ground. They try to cover him up. Yeah. Like they're trying to defend him because he's important, you know. Yeah. Former president, possibly future president. Yeah. And, you know, I, there was one man that died. Uh, Corey, I've watched so many videos to try to pronounce his name perfectly. But I've seen some people saw him, Comperator, Comperator. But his name is Corey Comperator. And he was a 50-year-old volunteer fire chief. And when the shot started, he dove on top of his wife and his daughter. Yeah. And as he was defending the thing that was the most important to him in the, in his life, he was struck with a bullet and died. Defending what was important to him, physically, his family. Yeah. We know what the word defense means. We use it in less important things like sports, right? Sports are important to some people, but they're not that important, right? Right. Nothing compared to like life or death, right? And so we defend things that are important to us. Yeah. We defend our family. We defend our children. You and I have talked about that before. And we're ready to defend them physically. I mean, me and me and you are always ready. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. To defend the people around us physically. Yeah. But are we ready to defend them spiritually? Because we always say things about, yes, yeah, Second Amendment. We need to be prepared to defend people physically. And we go through training courses and we practice and all this. And then we think about something that's even more important, which is spiritually, spiritual things, the spiritual fate of the people around us eternity. And some of us never, ever go to the range spiritually, right? Like we don't practice to defend people spiritually. And this is something that the Bible tells us we have to do. And that's what we want to talk about in this episode today. I agree. Yeah. No, that's great, man. Um, where are we going to go? Jude 3. That's what I'm saying. Jude, Jude is the perfect text. Right? Jude chapter 1. That's only, right. There's only one chapter. That's it. It's like sometimes someone's like, Jude 3. And they're like, what verse? I'm like, no, there's only one chapter. Yeah, just <laughs> so, three. Yeah. So Jude 3. All right. So Jude verses 1 and 2 are just a short intro, right? So this is Jude, supposedly the half-brother of Jesus, right? And it says, Jude, a bondservant of Christ and brother of James, right? So it's interesting. He doesn't say brother of Jesus. He yeah. says servant of Jesus, right? Yeah, he puts that yeah. relationship higher. Ahead of his, yeah. Yeah. So Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, you're called by the gospel, right? So these are Christians. Called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved 
in Jesus Christ. First Peter 1 Peter 1.5, kept by the power of God through faith, right? Your faith, continuing your faith, is how you're preserved, right? God can't, nobody can snatch you away. It doesn't mean you don't have to live faithfully. All right, verse two, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So he makes a really quick introduction, those two verses. And then he basically jumps right into his main point. We're gonna read verses uh, three, read verse three, just by itself for right now. Beloved, while I was very diligently, while I was very diligent, sorry, added a Y there, to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. So some key words in there. Um, diligent, he's making every effort. That's what the New American Standard says, to write to them. So he's basically saying to you Christians, I was very diligent, making every effort to write to you concerning common salvation, the gospel. And then he says, I found it necessary. Like when I was writing to you about the faith, I had to include this. Like this is absolutely, it's obligatory. Like you can't write about the common faith without talking about this, which shows you that what he's going to say is important, right? And he says, I had to do it. I had to write to you, exhorting you, encouraging you, appealing to you, some translations say. And what does he say? What does he say I have to tell you about? To contend earnestly for the faith, to fight, to defend for the faith, which was once for all, delivered or handed down to the saints. So earnestly contend, contend earnestly. Um, it's one word in Greek, two in English. But it means basically boxing, right? I don't watch much boxing, right? But if you are the heavyweight champion of the world, then who who is your main opponent that's coming up if you're the heavyweight champion? Boxing? Yeah, your number Man, one heavyweight I don't know. rhymes with Mentender. Contender? Yeah. <laughs> great. Oh. Good job. Good I, sometimes I get ones that are better than others. I'm sorry. If you're the heavyweight champion for of the world. For some reason, I was thinking like you were asking for a name of somebody. You were thinking like Mike, Ta- uh, yeah, Mike Tyson, like, what Jake Paul There's about something. to be a fight. I, like, I don't I don't keep up. Yeah, I don't know. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Just in general. No, I, I feel you. If you are the heavyweight champion of the world, then yeah. you have a number one contender. Yeah. Which somebody is, who's going to try to contend for the yeah, the they're you're gonna, gonna you're gonna like fight. Being contentious, you're gonna get together and fight. Yes, yeah. yes. In and, and the word means to fight, to struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, it might be surprising to some people, especially in our culture. Wait a minute. So Jude is encouraging through inspiration. So the Holy Spirit's doing it. He's encouraging. He's urging people. He's imploring them, begging them. Look, you have to do this. You need to fight for with people for the faith. You need to argue with folks. Yeah. What? Yeah. And people are like, wait a minute, why would God encourage you to fight, to struggle, to contend with people for the for the truth? Hey, does God not know in his omniscience that's going to turn some people off? People are going to say, you know, that's really judgmental. So when Jesus Someone's said, be unloving. turn the other cheek, he didn't mean just to let the truth get bashed. Correct. Yeah. I was trying to understand if that was rhetorical or if that was a genuine. It was. Yeah. It was. It was yeah. both. I yeah. don't know how to say that. It wasn't really. Yeah. It was rhetorical in a sense. That's like fine. I, I asked good. it as a question. I was thinking, but it was. Yeah. 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 I yeah. mean, that's valid. Look, Jesus taught with questions sometimes. I he mean, did. Yeah. He want get you to think. So. And so, yeah. Why would Why would God, through the pen of Jude, Jude's the penman, um, if he had a pen, stylus, you know, why yeah. would God? say that the faith My phone's gonna stop. must be defended, yeah. right? Different type of stylus. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, quill and, yeah. and, and quill yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Why does God through the pen of Jude say, I'm encouraging you to fight with people over the faith, right? Um, and so we want to look at that in this episode. Why, why is it important for you to contend for the faith? Why is it important if you have friends or relatives or coworkers uh, and they want to start talking about religious things? Should you just, you know, say, look, I want to go along to get along. And like we said, we're not saying be rude about it. No, but this you should is what, always be respectful. Right. This yeah. is what Jesus meant when he talked about, I bring a sword. Yeah. I didn't bring peace. Yeah. I'm bringing a sword. Yeah. I'm going to divide families up. Yeah. How? Yeah. Through the ones who accept the truth and the ones who reject the truth. Yeah. And the ones who accept it are going to have to contend for it. You know? Yeah. So. That's great. All right. So I think that just, I don't know, came to mind. It feels like that fits, you know? Yeah. I think it absolutely it's a great point. So um, men are lost in sin, right? This may be, you may be like, that's so basic. It is, yeah. But the basic things are important a lot because some of the most basic things, we say we believe them, but we don't live like we believe them, right? So why is it important for us to contend for the faith? Because the Bible says that all men are lost yeah. and all men are spiritually dead from their own sins. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is what? 
death. Death. It's not talking about physical death. It's talking about spiritual death. So Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So when you commit sin, which you do, right? Um, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short <coughs> of the glory of God. I'm just waiting. Yeah. <laughs> um, all are spiritually dead in their own sins, right? And so John 8, 34, Jesus said, men are slaves to sin. Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And so if all men commit sin, then what? They become enslaved to all sin. All men are enslaved to sin, <clears throat> right? So all men, every person, man or woman, who has reached the age of accountability, the level of accountability, that's a whole other episode in a different season, go watch that if you want to, that has reached the, the level of accountability, they are spiritually dead, they're slaves to sin, and they're lost. That's the bad news, right? Now, that's why Jesus came, Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Yes, right. That which, but this translation. That which was lost. Yeah. Right. So that's why Jesus came, right? To, to seek and save mankind. Um, go to Luke 15. Yeah. Go to Luke 15. All right. Uh, read verses 1 and 2. Look at who Jesus is dealing with. Then all, the, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man <laughs> receives sinners and eats with them. Yeah. Tax collectors and sinners, people who n not have a great reputation, right? Uh, tax collectors are seen as traitors. And yeah. It's interesting that they hate them that much. They have their own category. And then sinners, people who are sinful. And they draw near to um, Jesus teaching spiritual truths. You think the Pharisees and scribes would be like, okay, well, all right, maybe they're going to change their ways. This is great. No, but inside, and they're complaining about it, right? Yep. And so in this, in response to this um, response, in response to this response by the Pharisees and scribes, he tells a series of parables all about things that were lost and things that were found because he's trying to say, hey, look, this is why I'm talking to tax collectors and sinners because I'm trying to bring lost people back. That's my, that's my purpose, mm -hmm. right? Thanks for watching GBN. If you like programs like this and you want to watch other programs, maybe new ones that you haven't heard of yet, that you know, look, there's something out there. I just haven't figured it out yet or discovered it. Uh, go to the App Store. You can also find this on Apple TV, Roku. Search Gospel Broadcasting Network and download the app. Uh, it's a little globe. It says GBN in the middle. And you can open up the app. I have the app open right now. And you can look at all these different programs. Truth on Wheels, Drawn Toward God, which is like an animated series that as it's explained in the Bible, it sort of draws out the image. Counterpoint, The Authentic Christian, which is one of the shows that I'm on. Make It Plain, Preaching the Gospel, Answering the Error. So many different programs that I personally grow from myself, uh, even before I came to GBN. We also have books of the Bible. You can watch people who've been teaching books of the Bible at preaching schools for years teach through 50, I think right now, books of the Bible, verse by verse. And you can really just use this app to study, and learn more about God's word. So I'd recommend if you like Bible study, if you want to grow closer to God, draw near to him, James 4, 7 through 10, uh, download the Gospel Broadcasting Network app, and it'll help your everyday studies. Thanks for watching. And so he talks about the lost sheep. You know, a uh, man has 100 sheep, yeah. one leaves, and he leaves the 99 to go and find that sheep and how important that lost sheep is. And everybody rejoices, right? Um, and then he talks about the lost coin. And then he talks about the lost son. You want to you summarize the lost son, the parable of the lost son? The uh, you talking wayward about son, the went prodigal away? son. The prodigal son. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, pretty much. Um, it's a story. It's a parable. Mm -hmm. It's a heavenly story with a, or an earthly story with a heavenly meaning in yeah. the way that we would say it in preaching school. Yeah. Um, where he's trying to teach a point. And in the, in the story, one of at least two sons that are mentioned, leaves a father. He wants to leave a father early. He, he's tired of living under his father for whatever reason. He doesn't want to be a part of that household anymore, but he wants to leave with his inheritance. So he wants to go and sow his wild oats, as we used to say. Yeah. You know, I don't know how common that is anymore, no, but that's common. what he wants to do. Yeah. He wants to leave home with a lot of money. He wants to go out and party, and that's what he does. Yeah. In the story, he goes out and he lives a riotous life, yeah. right? Yeah. He blows all of his money. He ends up poor. He ends up working for a farmer or someone feeding his pigs, mm -hmm. which for a Jew, wasn't he wasn't really supposed to be dealing with them. Unclean animal. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, it has nothing to do with him. So he's, he's now, in the Jewish view, someone who is defiled, mm -hmm. 
impoverished, mm-hmm. sinful, and without family and et cetera. Like he's in a in the worst spot he could be in mm-hmm. the story, so to speak. Yeah. And he decides that he was wrong. He comes to himself, it says. He realizes he was wrong, and he says, I'll go back to my father's house, and I'll ask for mercy mm-hmm. and for grace. Maybe mm-hmm. he'll at least hire me as a worker, and I can work for him because I know the workers are better there than I am as a worker here. Yeah. All right, so he goes back, but his father, you know, he doesn't treat him like he hates him or mm-hmm. anything like that. Mm-hmm. He's eager to see him again. Mm-hmm. Um, he's not really concerned with the material wealth that was wasted. He's more concerned with the well-being of his son. Can I read that part? Yeah. This is Luke 15, 20. Sure. And he arose. That was a great summary, by the way. Just good job. Luke 15, 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Yeah. You know, it's his son. It's not. There's a video, an animated. It's an animated. It's like a reel I saw on Facebook once, and it showed the father. I mean, it's like I know what it would look like, but just seeing it, the father running, and of course now having two boys. Yeah. The son being gone, and the son being so ashamed to come home and scared to come home, and the you know is the father going to stand there and tap his foot while you walk up, you know, and the dad runs to him and yeah. throws his arm around him and kissed him. Yep. This and, is the the parable, I guess. Um, you know, should have came to mind for the Corinthians and Second Corinthians, right? Yeah. But anyway, sorry. Yeah. Side note. No, you're good. Verse twenty one. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. I have a note written in my Bible. Let me read it. Looks like it might be cool. It says, Elder men usually walked. Some say. They ran to reach. Some say that he, the father ran to reach the son before the city met him with stones. Could have, been, could have waited and scolded him, but he didn't. All right, so I guess some people say it's possible that the father ran because that the people knew what the son did and came home. I don't know that they would stop. I don't know. But that was what one commentator said. Either way. That maybe that was going through some of the people's minds that heard Jesus spoke it maybe. Is that what know. you're saying? Well, no, I think, I think it's basically saying that some say in that culture and time, that's that, what would have had to have happened. Yeah, possibly. If you yeah. knew that somebody had done those things to their father, what's one of the Ten Commands? Yeah, that's interesting. You know? Yeah, yeah. Obey father and mother. It's an interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah. Or be put to death. Sure. <laughs> I mean, like, so I don't know. I mean, it's just, anyway, speculation to some degree. But look at verse 21. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And then the father said to his servants, verse 22, Bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. And so the idea here is this person was lost and they came home. And of course the parable, the earthly story thrown beside, parabolo, para beside, balo to throw, the earthly story thrown beside the heavenly meaning is that the parable is to express the spiritual truth that lost sinners, no matter how rock bottom you've ever hit, if you're willing to come home to the Father, He will run to you. He will be ready for you to come home, right? And so the Bible teaches that men are lost no matter what sin you've committed. We talked afterwards with some of the production guys at the end of the episode we did, the most recent episode that we had already previously talked about the Jeffrey Dahmer and even read the letter. Like, if you think you have sin in your life that's too bad that you can't come back from, you're wrong, right? And that was a perfect example with the Dahmer story. So, number one, the reason that it's important to contend and defend and fight for the truth, for the faith, is because men are lost in sin. And men need to know it. And men need to know that they're lost. Yeah, you can't convince somebody that they're lost if they don't know that they've sinned. Yep. They don't know what sin is. Yep. They don't know that they're even in trouble. Yep. So yeah, you have to you have to start conflict in yeah. some sense of the word, yeah. like what we're talking about now. Yeah, you have to contend for the faith. Yeah, and so 
the reason men need to know about sin is because sin is what causes people to be lost. We talked about that with the guy on the Amazon. He's not lost because he's never heard the gospel. He's lost because he sinned. Right. And sin is a transgression of God's law. And you can't come into God's presence. Now, the solution to sin is Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and his blood, right? And so men are lost in sin. That's why it's important to fight for the faith. Number two, but the truth is what sets men free. Right. If men are lost, they can be found. If they're dead to sin, they need to have, be brought back to spiritual life. And if they're slaves to sin, they can be set free. And so Jesus said in John 8, 34, that he who commits sin is a slave to sin. And mm -hmm. ver two verses later in John 8, 36, he says, therefore, if the son makes you free, Jesus makes you free, you'll be free indeed. Mm -hmm. How? John 8, 32. Do you have that one? I do. Okay, go before You should know the truth and the truth, will sh the truth shall make you free. Yeah, that's the statement Jesus said. He said 32. Yeah, that's right. Say? That's yeah. right. John 8, 31, Jesus, basically there were many who believed in him. Mm -hmm. And then he tells these people who believed, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And they say, we're free. We've never been slaves to anybody. And instead of the low-hanging fruit, Babylon, Egypt, Rome, he says, no, I'm going to knock him down that hill. We're going to talk about your spiritual, the fact that you're slaves to sin, right? And so that's the common salvation Jews writing about. And he says, while I'm writing about this, about men being set free from sin, about lost people being found, I had to write to you about something else. He's compelled. It's necessary. And he has to encourage them to contend for the faith. And so the reason you have to defend the faith, men are lost, basic point number one, basic point number two, that Jesus, his truth, the gospel, is what sets men free and saves them. But here's number three. This is maybe the crux of why you need to fight for the gospel. There are people who want to change the gospel. Yeah, that's verse, that's verse three. Yeah. Verse four. Or, well, four. I mean, so you'd say, wait a minute, the gospel is good news. Who want to change it? Who'd want to mess it up? People who do it for a lot of reasons. I mean, the Pharisees wanted to mess it up immediately. Okay, why the Pharisees right? want to make it up? Because they wanted to be in control. Of they it. want to be in control. That's they it. and what comes with control? I mean, control is power. It's influence. It's fame. It's money. It's, it's money. Yep. It's all of those things. There it's, you go. It's power over people. Yes. That. Yes. You know? All those things. Yes, and people haven't changed. It's making yourself out to feel like God. Yes. And that's it. You, the, you want to make the decisions for there's, everybody. There's a lot of reasons. Um, some people, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There are a lot of reasons why there are false teachers in the world, right? Yeah. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, says this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. With all unrighteous deception among those who perish... Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So people saw the truth. They didn't love it. And what would have happened if they had loved it and they had obeyed it? They would have what? Been saved. Yep. But because they didn't love the truth, they rejected it. They weren't saved in verse 11. For this reason, God will send them a strong delusion as a form of punishment for seeing the truth and rejecting it. God will send you a strong delusion. Say, God would never do that. Yes, he would. God's allowed to punish you. For evil actions. And if you see the truth and you reject it, God will send you a strong delusion. Look, that they should believe the lie. So God says, you see the truth, but you don't care enough to obey the truth. That's fine. I'm not going to force it on you. I will send you a strong delusion. I will let you believe a lie. Verse 12, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had what? Pleasure. Pleasure in unrighteousness. When you see the truth and you reject it, God will then let you Go down your own road. He won't force it on you. He'll allow you to believe a lie. He'll allow you to be delusional. You think you're following the yeah, truth. Yeah, there's a lot of not. people right now, if you just turn on the TV, that have a lot of pleasure and unrighteousness. Like you can see yeah. it yeah. on their face. Like yep. they're happy. And then you're also watching what they're doing. Yep. And you're like, wow. And you I think know? those people are obvious and it's easy to see. It is. And I think the more deceptive ones that that he's talking about here. I guess he's not only talking I about false teachers. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I was just saying, like, that's an easy way. Oh, I agree. Th that's what comes to mind now when I'm reading su through some of these things. Yeah, it's you're like, not wrong. You know, anyway, I didn't mean to derail. No, you're not. Yeah, no, you're, you're not derailing. You're not wrong. I mean, look, look at verse four. Dif it, was a, Here's, it was a different track is all I mean. But, that's sorry. fine. I'm rambling. So there are those who want to change the gospel. Yeah. Why would they want to change the good news? Some people just love sin. Yeah. Right. It's pleasurable. Hebrews 11 says that right? But it's for a season. It's temporary, yeah. right? Some people are short-sighted. They don't look to play the long game, right? There are some people who like money, power, and authority, and they want influence. Maybe they've had it in the business realm, and they come into religion, 
and they want it in religion. I can think of a few guys who I've heard were successful business people. They come and they start, you know, being a preacher. And the sad thing too is there are people, I can think of other people. I won't mention it by name. I can think of young guys who have watched the podcast, who have reached out. We've had discussions and they've seen it, man. They've told me, like, I, I see it. Like, I know I need to be baptized. But they don't for certain reasons. Maybe it's their family. Maybe it's their girlfriend. Maybe it's their spouse. And then what happens? They don't stay that gung-ho about it. If they, they see the truth, they tell me they need to obey the gospel. And they don't because they're waiting on somebody else. And you know what happens? I can think of a few. I can think of one young guy in particular that as time goes on, they become basically less and less affected by it yep. to where they basically now completely reject it. And they would say that, that what we teach is false. And it's so funny. It's like, what changed? You know, why would you call me and say, hey, my church is not teaching the truth. I need to be baptized, you know? And then what, what did the scriptures change? No. No? You know, the scriptures are still just as clear as they were whenever you said, I know I need to do it, right? So what you have is you have people who when they reject the truth, right, the, they get calloused against it. It's why, you know, basically, hey, look, if you know you need to obey the gospel, do not wait. Because if you see the truth and you could be saved, but you reject it, the Bible says you have pleasure in unrighteousness. Right. And that's what verse 4 says. The reason you need to contend for the faith earnestly, I implore you, <coughs> I had to talk about it, Jude says, when I'm writing to you. Why? Verse 4. Read, read Jude chapter, read 3 and 4 just together. All right. Let me get back over there. Okay. This long is. Yeah, read Jude 3 and 4. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So essentially, we need to defend the truth because false teachers exist, right? There is a spiritual being named Satan, the accuser, the adversary, right? He's described as a lion. I want to read the passage in 2 Corinthians. Um, I, want, I, want, I want to read you what is said here, uh, 2 Corinthians 10. All right. You know, this verse 4 reminds me of Paul running in Romans. Shall we continue in sin? The grace, grace may abound. abound you know? Meganoito. God yeah. forbid. Certainly not. That's Absolutely right. not. But that's still happening. Yeah. Continue in grace. Well, Second Peter two talks about it too. They turn it into licentiousness or lewdness. Second Peter, here. Second Peter chapter two talks about false teachers who basically promise you liberty. You know, I mean, I think it's guys today that say, Oh, you, you, you of you, you those of you in the Church of Christ and New Testament church, you say you have to obey, you have to obey God, live faithfully. You don't have to live faithfully. God will always bring you back. And Second Peter says they promise them liberty, but when whenever you leave the truth, they actually bring you back into bondage under sin. Because you've left the truth. You don't have salvation anymore. You left Jesus and what he actually taught, right? Yeah, they and liberated I, you from the Lord. Oh, I hear that all the time. I mean, I've, I've dealt with it firsthand. People that say, oh, you guys are in such bondage, you know. Whenever you see the, tr the, the real, true gospel, that you don't have to live faithfully. It's like, yeah, that sounds really appealing, but that's exactly what the devil wants you to think, you know. So look at, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, right? Look at verse uh, 4. Look, verse 3. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. What kind, of, what kind of warfare do we fight as Christians? Spiritual warfare. The, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly, physical, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments. Wait a minute. You can't have an argument with anybody. No. If you are going to defeat... No, uh, you're going to cast down their arguments. You cast down their arguments, right? Uh, Titus chapter 1 says you stop their mouths. Whenever they speak false things, you stand up and say, that's false, and here's what the Bible says, and that's why it's wrong, right? Um, that's why I think debates are great. I think debates are great. Yeah. Because you don't see the weak point in someone else's argument in general conversation. No one's going to say, today I'm going to preach to you on this, and these are the weakest arguments. No one ever does that. People always try to shy away from their weak points, right? You don't want to give the impression that you're not 100% sure about something. Right. And debates, you could say, tell me what you believe. Okay, here's what I believe. I heard what you said. How do you answer this verse? Well, we'll get to that verse. I, I can't wait to talk about that verse. And then they never want to talk about that verse, right? So that's what that's what Paul says. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing 
that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the what? Obedience of Christ. Oh, you don't have to do anything. No, the Bible, the word obey means to do something. It means to agree with something and to follow up in obedience, right, with action. So being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, right? And so he talks in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He talks a little bit more about this, right? Look at verse 11. Oh, that chapter one, uh, 11, verse 1, okay. 2 Corinthians. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. He's like, just just, just bear with me, right? Just uh, allow me to to say this, for I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy. I care about you. I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Church is the bride of Christ, Ephesians 5. But I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Those of you who teach once saved, always saved, is this what it sounds like Paul's saying to them? Hey, look, guys, you know, you're fine. If you're really saved, Nothing can draw you away, right? No, I'm not worried about that. No, Paul's like, I'm afraid that someone is going to deceive you and lead you away. Yep. Verse You're going to be tempted off just like Eve. Yes. Verse four, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, just like Galatians 1, another gospel, another Jesus, or if you receive a different spirit, 1 John 4, 1, test the spirits for many false prophets have gone out into the world, right? Or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. He's telling the Corinthians, you guys are getting a completely different gospel than what I taught you, and you're putting up with it, right? Look at verse six or five. For I consider I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Verse seven, did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge. I, air quotes, robbed other churches. He basically says, look, I could have told you all you need to support me in my work, but right. I didn't because I wanted you to know that I had pure motives. Yep. Right? We don't sell anything at the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Everything we give out is free. We we never sell things, you know. It's if someone wants to if someone contacts us, hey, we'd like to support you, that's fine. But we don't actually say, hey, look, you, we're gonna we don't charge for our lessons, right? Paul says, I did it for free so that you wouldn't say I had a bad motive, right? That's why we do what we do, right? Yeah, in a lot of ways, it's kind of the same thing. Like yeah. a lot of other churches and people support us. That's right. So that we never ask for money on air. We don't do things That's like right. that. That's right. And why? Because of this. Same exactly. This is the verse, right? Yeah. yeah. Verse 9, when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. There were times Paul was there and he really needed money, and he basically didn't ask him for it, right? Okay. Then go down to verse uh, 12. But what I do, I will continue to do it. Then I may cut off the opportunity for those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things which they boast. He's like, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because I want to wreck these false teachers and their arguments. Look at verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. They want to look like an apostle of Christ. Verse 14, and no wonder. Why are you surprised at this? Why are you surprised when false teachers look like true teachers. Verse 14, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing, don't be surprised, if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. What does a false teacher want to look like? The good guy. A good guy. Yeah. The true teacher. The right one. The right one. What does Matthew seven fifteen say? Beware when oh. false teachers come to you, they look like sheep, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. Yeah, like that that those, yes, yeah, they dis, yes, they disguise themselves. Yes, um, yeah, Matthew seven fifteen. I didn't read that. Beware of Got false it. prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, yeah, they are ravenous wolves. Yeah, when you look at them, you're like that guy doesn't look like a false teacher. What's a false teacher look like? Well, they want to look like a sheep. He doesn't look like or an anything. angel of light. Yeah. He looks. Yeah. He looks. In a very literal good. sense. Like, if we're talking about in the spiritual sense or whatever, they want to try to appear like the God. But in the physical sense, physical yeah, they sense. look like us. Yeah. Because like, they they're look just like, human they beings. They look like everybody else. They're human beings. And you can't tell. No. You know? Not you, by their looks. Not by their looks. By the fruits. Yeah. When they open their mouth and they Comes start out of talking. their mouth and what they do, what they write, what they spread. That's right. You know, the things. That's they come right. out of what they're saying and doing. That's right. Uh, are they biblical fruits? You can judge that by the Bible. That's exactly right. That's and exactly if they're right. not, then 
I mean, they're not biblical fruits. Why do you want that? Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes one of the problems, the reason we don't engage in more controversy or, you know, disputing or disagreements about religious matters, myself included for a long, my, most of my 20s, right? Yeah. Um, is I don't think that we think sin is that big of a deal. It's I don't think we think it's as big a deal as it is. And I don't think that we think Satan is out to destroy us like he is. I mean, it, Satan is described. Read First Peter 5, 8. How is, how is Satan described in the Bible? How does Hollywood describe him? Hollywood shows him as, you know, this kind of mischievous guy. Yeah, a, a misunderstood delinquent who sometimes gets in trouble but means well. Like, all, go watch... Like, don't go watch. But, like, if you look at all the TV shows they make yeah. and they fight, like, the main character is the devil and yeah. he's really a lawyer, this or that, yeah. that lives here. He's a good guy. You know, he wants that fun. Yeah. God is the no fun guy. Yeah. The devil's like, oh, God, he's he's lame. He's he's up. Yeah. They try know. to paint, like, he's not really he's bad. He's got his pants on too tight up there. You yeah. know, I'm just trying to help y'all have fun. We just want to have fun. We just want to kick back a little bit, you know, and, oh, Mr. No Fun. Yahweh up there. That's how they depict him. Yeah. In Hollywood. Absolutely. You know, and that's exactly how the devil would depict him. Yeah. Look, I don't know how spiritual warfare and the the that's spiritual exactly realm it. works. It's almost like but, you could read it that way. Go back. Oh, you will not surely die. You know, like go he back just to doesn't want Genesis. you to have fun. He doesn't yeah. want you to know all just, the good stuff. Look, it's good fruit. You know, just eat it. That's how a lot of people picture the devil. I remember uh the Adam Sandler, I don't know. Maybe there, there are movies that I watched when I was unfaithful at church that the messages stick with me. Yeah. And there was an Adam Sandler movie where the devil was like ruling hell. Yeah. Like yeah, he yeah. was in I charge of it. Yeah. yeah. And so that's not how it works. No. Hell is not where the devil runs it. And it's like he does what he wants to do. And if you're, you know, really wicked, you get you're to party. You're not going to hang them. out with people no, in hell. You're going to be punished. Yeah. Right. We did a whole episode on hell. It's like so, infinite solitary confinement and agony or something. For I mean, the, the devil too. Yeah. Matthew 25 says yeah. that hell was created for the devil and his angels. God does not want you to go there. He doesn't want you to go there. He wants all men to be saved. Second yeah. Peter 3, 9, right? It's not Calvinism, which says, uh, yeah, there are some people that God created and they inherited the Adam. They weren't given the gift of perseverance like uh, Adam wasn't given it. Therefore, they inherited the sin. And so they're going to be in hell forever and there's nothing they can do about it. What a depressing doctrine, right? Yeah. You know, a completely except, unbiblical. Except, yeah, exactly. They it, jump through a thousand you talk about It's seg- lies is what it is. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching the Authentic Christian Podcast on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. On our episode, we always say that our goal is just to go back and teach what they taught in the Bible. First uh, Peter 4.11 says, if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. So throughout the episode, we talk about lots of different topics. But one of the things that we always want to extend is an invitation for you to reach out to us. You can reach us at the email, Authentic Christian Podcast at gmail.com. So whether you have Bible questions, whether you watch something in the episode and you say, now, I don't think my church teaches that. I'm having some questions. You can always send us your church's website. You can send us your zip code. If you need a church, you say, look, I want to find a church that worships and teaches the same thing that they did in the New Testament. If you want that, we'd be happy to help you. So please reach out to us at authenticchristianpodcast at gmail.com. And we'd love to help you find a church that's teaching what the church that you read about in the Bible taught. Thanks for watching. Hope you have a great day. We'll see you back on the next episode. Second Corinthians talks about a different Jesus. That's yeah. a different Jesus. That's a Jesus that says, no, everybody does not have a chance, right? The Bible says everyone does have a chance. That's a different Jesus. It's a yeah. different gospel. I will fight for that tooth and nail. 100%. Yeah. I'm not ashamed to no. say that it's a lie. Yes. Like Calvinism a is a lie. Yes. It is a lie of the devil. It's a different God. I don't hate the people's souls. Not who, at all. Who, who are following that. A lot of them but are But what they say, I hate that. Yeah. Absolutely. Like God hates the deeds of, Nicol- of the Nicolaitans That's or right. something like that. It's something like that. Yeah. I don't hate their soul, them, yeah. but what they're doing is dragging people to hell. Yeah. It is. They are helping the enemy. Some people are, I think, surprised to hear that when you realize, like, wait, God, wait, God hates certain things. I mean, yeah, Revelation yeah. chapter two and verse six, but this you have, this is a good thing, this characteristic church, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Yeah, he's complimenting Which them I also hate. On their hate. Yeah. And two, Revelation For 2, 15. what? For evil. For evil. Right. Revelation 2.15. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Right. So God hates false doctrine, right? And what he, he wants say? people Not only to come out of it. those that teach it, but those who hold up the hands of those okay. who teach. What's that? What passage Romans 1.32. Let's go see. I Romans 1.32 it's, is... It's right there on the tip of my tongue. I think Romans 1.32 is the same idea. Yeah, it is. Okay. It is. It, right. It's at least that idea. That's good. Read who it. having the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do they... 
not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Yeah. So it gives you a long list of sins in Romans chapter 1, verses yeah. 24 or 23, maybe all the way to 31. And it says, not only those who practice these things, but those who approve of those who do, right? And so you have this idea in our culture, which is the devil's not that bad. You have the idea in Scripture, he wants to destroy you. He he is a lion on the prowl. The word for walks about is peripateo. I think of like a shark circling, like wants to to kill you. Yeah. He wants you to perish with him. He's he's not happy. He's angry that he's going to be spending eternity in hell. And what does he want? He wants you right there behind. He knows that God loves mankind. And the number one way he can try to get back at mankind is to try to take as much of mankind as he can with him to hell. And so, I mean, have you ever seen the movie The Ghost in the Darkness? No. Man, all right. Uh, I haven't seen it in a long time. Um, it's a, It's got Val Kilmer and... Uh, Oh, one of the there's like six of them, like family members. I can't think of that one's name. It's it's anyway. Um, it's a it's a it's based on a true story, right? So in Kenya, which I've been to Kenya on mission work, and one of the first times I decided to go to Kenya, I remember the first thing I looked up was where Savo was and where if I was going anywhere near it, <laughs> even though I knew the lions died like hundred to hundred and fifty years ago, right? But anyway, so it's a true story. It's a movie based off of this pair of man eating lions in Savo, Kenya, which is like southeastern part. In Kenya, you've got the world map up there. Yeah. It's too far away. In Kenya, the western part of Kenya, northwest is like Kasumu near Uganda. Central Kenya is Nairobi, which is like the main city. And then southeastern down on the coast is Mombasa. And so between like Nairobi and Mombasa is where Savo is. So southeastern Kenya, right? And right around 1900, right before 1900, there was a railway project where they're building a railroad across uh, Kenya. And these two man-eating lions were like terrorizing. They were killing people in broad daylight, like no fear, right? Like not typical behavior yeah. for lions, right? And so there was one railway worker that wrote about it that said hundreds of men fell victim to these savage creatures whose very jaws were steeped in blood. And so in the, the movie, they bring in this world-famous hunter who uh, I think is I think it's Val Kilmer, Michael Douglas. That's what I, Michael Douglas, Char, yeah, Michael Douglas, I think. And uh, Val Kilmer. And so they bring in this world famous hunter and his job is to try to hunt these lions in the night, right? So he kills a lion. They take the claw and make it a necklace and he thinks that he killed it. And then they keep killing. And they realize that wasn't it. And so then they bring in the Maasai people who I got to go spend time with on a mission trip. It was cool. They gave That's me like cool. my own you know, thing. And they would have laughed at me if we did the jumping because they're super athletic. Anyway. They bring in the Maasai warriors who got kill lions all the time. And um, the two Maasai warriors, not two, the Maasai warriors name the go the lions, the ghost in the darkness. They call them the ghost in the darkness. And it's it's a terrifying movie because they just keep killing people and they try, they cannot capture them, right? It's like they're elusive. And um, finally they track them to the lair and they go into the lion's lair. They have hundreds of human bones all over. Like they've been dragging these people back, right? And so they basically find, that they know that by now, they've killed like a hundred and some people. Um, some records say less, but some say it's up to 135. They see these lions and they've been killing, they're man eaters. They've been killing not for food, but like for sport, for fun. They just loved killing, right? And that's how I picture the devil when I read First yeah. Peter 5, 8. Like he's not a house cat, even though I don't really, I mean, House cats make me nervous too, because <laughs> I had a buddy named John that I stayed at his house as a young kid, and I would sleep on the couch. And his cat one night, I woke up and it was like this regular sized cat, and it was like hissing at me on the top of the couch. Like that's a house cat, a lion, man. Yeah, that's what the devil is. Like that's how God chose this inspired word to depict him. Like what's a bigger, more ferocious cat that was in that region? Nothing. He's like, how do I describe how the, much the devil wants to kill you? What's the most fearsome animal that I can think of? You know, like if, yeah. if you lived in the poles, maybe he'd have been like, he's a polar bear, right? No, he's out on the prowl. He wants, he's hunting, he, you. He's hunting and he wants to kill you. Do he's you picture, you. do you picture the devil like he's that? Sneaking up on you. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you picture that? Do you picture false teachers as out for your, look, some of them are misled. Some of them saw the truth and rejected it, and some of them are sincere. I know that. I've talk, I talk to them all the time, every week. I know they're sincere, but the fact, the reason they have to be withstood and you have to contend for the faith is because they'll cause people to be lost. Yeah. They will cause 
people, well-meaning people, to be lost. Destructive doctrine, Second yes. Peter chapter two calls it, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what does it say? Um, can I read it? What, yeah, go one ahead. through three. Yeah, go I ahead. Think it's one through three. Yeah, Second Peter chapter two verse one. Um, through. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, mm -hmm. even denying the Lord who who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of the truth will be blasphemed. For are by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Mm -hmm. Go if you have time on your own. Read all of Second Peter chapter two. Second yeah. Peter chapter one. He talks about now that you're a Christian, you need to grow in the faith. He gives us faith plus seven Christian graces. Why? He says, if you do these things, you'll never stumble. And then he says in chapter two, because there are false prophets. Right. That's why. It, it's literally Second Peter chapter one and and two are just like Jude three and four. Yeah. God told us that we need to be um, wise as serpents and harmless as doves, mm -hmm. and then He taught us how to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. Second Peter chapter two verse eighteen. For they speak great swelling words of emptiness. I love that. The Greek bloated, pompous, emotional words of emptiness. Their vain and false religion, lacking purpose. So they speak these great swelling words. They sound so charismatic, and they sound like such an inspiring message. But when you actually dial down to what is he saying, he's not really saying anything. Empty. His words are empty. Right. They allure. It's funny that word in verse eighteen of Second Peter chapter two. The word allure. And the word in verse 14, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. The word entice and allure, I think it's the same word in Greek, and it means to take with bait. And, of course, Peter was a what? Fisherman. Fisherman, yeah. Right? So the word it goes back to fishing, right? You bait a hook, and the hook is concealed. And so it's like the hook of false teachers is concealed with these great swelling words. You know, wow, like, man, that guy can't be a false teacher. He's so inspiring. He's so emotional when he speaks. It's like, yeah, but what is he saying? In high school basketball, uh, my assistant coach, if he ever sees this, he'll know who he is. He's just screaming at me. Man, <laughs> I mean, screamed at me. I think it's because he knew that my dad raised me well and I wouldn't talk back. I was always like, yes, sir, uh, or I wouldn't respond at all. But I remember he would yell at me, and I always went to the hoop with one hand. I finished basketball, I never finished with two hands, and he'd say, you need to take it strong. He'd yell at me. I'd go home and tell my dad, how was practice? Man, coach will not quit screaming at me. And he's like, all right, but what did he say? I'm like, who cares what he said? He's screaming at me. He's like, no, no, no. What did he say? And I'm like, you told me to finish strong with two hands. And my dad's like, do you need to do that more? I'm like, maybe. It's like, okay. So ignore the way he said it and listen to what he says. Flip that around. Ignore the way. I, I see these false teachers all the time. That are, they're, they're charismatic guys. I get it. People are like, I listen to so-and-so uh, and he's yeah, so emotional. Judge not by appearance, but judge righteous judgment. John 7, 24. That goes what both do they ways. Say? Like you yes. can apply that and say, don't judge people because of the way that they look. Yes. In the sense of judging down. Yes. But also don't judge people because of the way they look. Yeah. Judging up. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so they speak great swelling words of emptiness. And then verse 19, while they promise them liberty, false teachers will promise you liberty from, you know, in, in our case, they'll promise you liberty from the crushing, the crushing weight of obeying Christ's commands. I recall the New Testament saying his words, his commands aren't burdensome, but that's just what I remember, you know, the Bible saying. But while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom the false teachers, a person is overcome, by him he is also brought into bondage someone who was free from sin, but a false teacher drags them back into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled and overcome by them, the latter end is worse than the beginning. Well, wait a minute. Were these people saved? Yeah, they were. Because how were they lost, saved, and then the worst, they're in a worse position now than the beginning? Well, before they were just lost. Now they had been saved and they left the truth that they knew and they were lost. It would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness, worse for them to have not known the way of righteousness, than having known it to turn from the holy commandment. It's happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to its vomit, a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. So this is obviously not once saved, always saved. No. And the devil wants to take people who've never been saved and trick them so to them be saved. But hear the truth, Luke 8, parable of snower, snower, sower, Satan wants to snatch that word out of your heart so that you won't believe it and be saved. Right. right. And then you have others who are members of the church and false teachers. They want to basically go out into the, the area and they want to 
make connections with true Christians, and they want to pull you off. They want to pull you off privately so they can spew their stuff privately to you, right? Come to this private Facebook group where we can we can try to lead you away from the church, and we can manipulate you, right? I see it happen every day. So that's what false teachers do, right? And in Jude 4, it says they crept in unnoticed. Uh, the, the Greek lexicon BDAG, Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich. It says this. The word defines the word as to slip in stealthily, to sneak in. You know, I don't know if you've ever done it before and you get like past curfew when you're younger, you try to slip in, hmm. right? Jude says that's what false teachers do. They don't want to make a scene. They don't want to be noticed. They want to come in through the side door. They want to come in through the side door. They want to use that sort of secret of entrance. That's why Matthew 7, 15 says, hey, they look like sheep. And we forget what God says. We see a guy who's nice, charismatic, says some good things, has a big following on YouTube, and we say, hey, he didn't look like a false teacher. I'm just going to listen to a little bit of his stuff, right? And next thing you know, you're listening to his stuff more than you're listening to stuff from members of the church. False teachers don't walk in your congregation with a T-shirt. He's not going to have red horns, right? Galatians chapter 2 and verse 4, listen to what it says of the Judaizing teachers. This occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came out, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. False teachers will come from the outside secretly. They'll say, oh, no, hey, I just want to discuss, I just want to talk with you, I just want to discuss things. No, like, yeah, please, let me, let me talk to all the people that you know. Yeah, please, let me come in there. And they act real nice and charismatic into you, and then they get inside into your people, and they start trying to tear things apart, right? They have been tearing the church up for 2000 since years. the church started. That's exactly right. I mean, they really have done a good job of trying to tear the church up and prevent yep. people from coming into it, too. And why? Many of them, because they want money and they want a following. Yep. I see every guy that goes and gets a you know, a degree from a school wants to start his own church, right? False teaching is far more popular than biblical truth. Absolutely. Like, well, of the religious world, yep. like 95% of it is probably I agree. just false teaching. Yeah, it's funny and, how, People say, you know, it seems like it seems like you think everyone's a false teacher. I'm like, no, I think those that teach false things are false teachers. Yeah. Like, show show me somebody that you yeah. like as a teacher, and I'll first thing I'll do is look at what he says about how a person becomes saved. If he says something different in the New Testament, yeah, he's a false teacher. Gone. I don't have to be the, mean yeah, about it. No more reason to consider him for a valid mentor in my life. Yeah, completely. I will not listen to this person in any way at all. No teaching. No advice. I know he's a false teacher now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the, yeah. And they don't only come from the outside. They come from the inside. Look at Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 31. Paul basically says, I'll just read it. Verse 29, Acts 20, verse 29. Paul says, for I know this, after my departure, savage wolves, Matthew 7, 15, will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. There are lots of people who are raised in the church, and they don't like the way things are going, right? And they say, I think I'm going to go start my own church over here, right? Yeah. And so a lot of times, they'll do this. They'll draw away disciples after themselves. They want influence. They want power. They want money. Like, I don't want to work a hard job. I want to, I want people to follow me, right? And so they do this. In verse 31, it says, watch. That's an uh, imperative command in Greek. Watch. And remember, for three years, I did not cease to warn you, warn everyone night and day with tears. Jude says, I had to talk to you about it. It was necessary. I could not talk about salvation without talking about watch these false teachers who want to come in. It's a big deal. So many yeah. people today are like, man, you don't need to talk about false teachers so much. It's like, all right, well, you know, Paul did and uh, Jude did, which means the Holy Spirit did, which means God said, watch out for false teachers. Read your New Testament. Start, you know, you can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and see how much Jesus talks about the Pharisees said this, but I say to you, right? It's false teaching. Read Acts read, was it Acts uh, 17? Look at what Paul did, right? Is Paul a good example for what, imitate me as I imitate Christ? He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Listen to this, Acts chapter 17 and verse 1. Now when they had, Luke stayed in Philippi. That's why it says they, because Luke's, sometimes it says we, it's when Luke's with them. <coughs> now when they had passed through Amph Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned that were dialexado, discourse, or argued, right, by bringing together different reasons. So Paul, listen to three words in this verse. Paul reasoned, okay, means discoursed or argued with different reasons. He, he uh, reasoned with them with from the scriptures, explaining, that word is diagonoion, I think, to open the sense of a thing and expound it, to open up thoroughly. 
and demonstrating, that word paratithmos, minos, means to propound, right? To place arguments beside one another. So he reasoned, he explained, he demonstrated that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. So Paul is literally, and then of course verse 4 of, of uh, Acts 17, 4, and some of them were persuaded or convinced. So Paul goes into a synagogue full of religious people and says, hey, uh, we need to discuss some things, and I'm going to make arguments to show you why you're wrong. And my goal is to convince you. That's my goal. If you watch this podcast and you don't agree with me, my goal is to convince you. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like, I don't think that we're mincing words about that. We're no. trying to teach you what we believe the Bible says right here. I That's mean, right. And, and everywhere that we go and we teach it, we're going to do our very best to prove that's what the Bible is actually saying. That's right. And if we say anything that it's not, you should ignore it and maybe point it out to us even. That's you know, right. like if we're wrong and you can show us, yep. and that ought to be, we all ought to be looking at what does it say. Completely agree. Right? And so if men are lost and the truth sets them free, what is our duty when we encounter false teaching that opposes this truth? It's to contend yes. for the faith. Will it be awkward? Yep. Will it be seen as unloving? Of course. Some people. But what is the cost if we don't do it? Literally the only thing that matters. Yeah. Like exactly. that's, I don't know how else to say that. Like no, the only right. thing that matters is your soul. Everything else is going to burn. I've said that before. Yeah. And one day it's true. Yeah. Even our precious little keepsakes. Yeah. They're all going to burn. Yeah. Us, my body, me, my, my, my grandparents, my children. Yeah. Eventually the physical world is yeah. going to burn. Yeah. Your soul can escape the burn. Yeah. If you obey the gospel, so to yeah. speak, right? You but know, that's it. That's the only thing that really matters. We're 59 minutes in. Let's go ahead and stop here. We'll come back in the next episode and talk more about, you know, men are lost, the truth sets them free, and false teachers want to basically pull you away from the truth. And the truth is that you need to obey the gospel. And you just yeah. mentioned that. Let's come back and talk about that in the next part of this episode. Thanks for hanging out with me, Aaron, and Scott. We'll see you back in the next episode. We'll talk about part two for contending and defending the faith. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching the Authentic Christian Podcast. If you want to watch the rest of this episode or other episodes, you can go to our website, gbntv.org, and click on the On Demand section. Or you can go to YouTube, Roku, Apple TV, or you could download the Gospel Broadcasting Network app. Just go on the App Store, search Gospel Broadcasting Network, download the app, and you can watch this show and many other great shows and learn more about the Bible. Thanks for watching the Authentic Christian Podcast. We'll see you back on the next episode.